Before I begin to read uh, the bio, I just wanted to let the... So I'd like to get to uh, the big order of business today, which is the, the uh, introduction to uh, an incredible person and speaker that we have today. Today, we are in conversation with Dr. Andrew B. Campbell. Dr. Campbell is an Ontario certified teacher and has been an educator for over 25 years in countries such as Jamaica, the Bahamas, and Canada. He has authored two books, Teachable Moments with Dr. ABC, A Spoonful for the Journey in 2015, and The Invisible Student in the Jamaican Classroom in 2018. His research and scholarship focus on issues of equity, diversity, inclusion, cultural competency, education leadership, 2SLGBTQ plus issues, and teacher performance evaluation. Dr. Campbell continues to present at various peer-reviewed academic conferences across North America and the Caribbean. He is a workshop facilitator, a motivational speaker, and has delivered several keynotes. Dr. Campbell appreciates fashion, enjoys traveling and meeting new people, and equally finds pleasure in bringing his community together to share a good meal. I don't know how, Dr. Andrew Campbell, we haven't had you sooner. And we did speak about uh, how this was a long time coming to have you uh, come to our board. And it is my uh, absolute honor to welcome you. Uh, and uh, if the group can join me in welcoming Dr. Campbell. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you so much. And um, thank you, thank you, thank you. And it's a pleasure for me to be here. I know we the session has been recorded and I intentionally also um, ask that um, you it not be a webinar format, but that it be a format where we can interact. So the session has been recorded. I'm sure you're not afraid of your faces. So if you wish to come on camera at any point in time in the conversation, knowing it's being recorded, please feel free to do so. This is a conversation among teachers with teachers. And so that is quite good for us to engage like that. And so we're going to get right into our conversation this evening, this afternoon, and then there'll be some opportunity for Q&A. As said before, I know many of you have sent your Q&A in before, but also for me, I like to, to ensure that the Q&A that I answer first are the ones that are in the box and the ones that are current. Because oftentimes when we get into this work, many of us know what the work is supposed to be like, though we are not doing the work. And so the, even the Q&A becomes a measure of performing more than engaging and learning. So I want to make sure we say that. I say that to everybody before. And so it's an honor for me to be a part of this conversation with you. And, 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 I, and I like to use one of my favorite word, if you have seen me speak before, is the word journey. And so for me, I, I want to say I'm honored to be a part of your continued journey. And I use the word continued journey because it is my hope and trust that none of us here, it's new to the conversation, that none of us here who have taken the time out of our long day to log in is new to the conversation. And here is the truth. This invitation was given to many persons. And I always know that the persons who are here oftentimes are the ones who are already engaged in the work. And so many persons, and I know there are gonna be a myriad of reasons why you couldn't be here, especially if you're watching the video later on. But there is also a, 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 a a practice among us as educators, when it's not mandatory, when it's not in a staff meeting, when you don't need to say, I am present because I want people to see that I was present, then we do not engage. And, there's, and that is why we have issues right now in racism and anti-Black racism, issues in homophobia, Islamophobia, issues in all the kind of marginalization and, and oppressive practices. Because many of us, we have not been intentional in our action. I listened to your prayer when you were praying, Nancy, I love to, to do that. And I heard you said, oh, you know, to hold that many of us have been complicit. That is absolutely the case. And then you talk about how can we, I think there were three or four times you, you said, how can we? And that for me calls to action. So as you are engaging in this conversation, I would love for you to remember the prayer that was that was prayed at the beginning of this session and the number of times the moderator used the term, how can we? Because that honestly is a call for accountability. That honestly is a call for how do I show up as an educator when it comes to these issues in my classroom? It's a call 
that this is not something at the head office, but it's something inside my classroom. It's not something in the library books, but it's also something in my curriculum. It's not something in the new idea. It's something in my own pedagogy and classroom practice. And I want us to think about that as we get into this conversation. We're gonna talk a little bit about the influence of our own social location. We're gonna talk a lot about that our power, our privilege, our access, the biases we hold, the assumptions we made, how many of us as educators have been caught up in deficit thinking of a particular group and how that deficit thinking has influenced how we see our students, has, has influenced our work, has influenced our classroom practice and pedagogy. And so we wanna talk about that, you know, and what it looks like to disrupt the work of disruption. I show, you know, when I when we started doing this conversation, especially way back in 2020, when many, many persons started in the conversation, I have been doing this work long before, and we started to hear the word disrupt. And everybody was trying to figure out, well, how do I disrupt as a classroom teacher? What does disruption look like for me? And so I want to ask you that question. What does disruption look like for you? because I'm, I cannot answer that question. And if that question is in the list of questions, I've already gonna to answer it by saying, what does disruption look like for you? Because as educators, we all have the, have the, the opportunity to, opportunity, we all have the responsibility, we all have access to tools and ways of doing the disruption. And disruption don't mean turning over the table and blocking the street and tying yourself to a building and marching and tweeting. Disruption can look like many forms. One of the biggest disruption that we need to do with anti-Black racism is how we love and treat and care for black students. I'm gonna repeat myself. One of the biggest tool we have of disruption in anti-black racism is how as educators, we love, honor, care for the black students in our classroom. Because when we talk about black students are being disengaged, when we talk about black students are being marginalized, when we talk about the trauma and hurt that is meted out to black students, I want us to remember it happens in our classrooms. It's not a magical classroom. The, the, the anti-Black racism is happening in our classrooms. The anti-Blackness is happening in our classrooms. The deficit thinking is happening in our classroom. They, they, I wonder why you are here is happening in our classroom. Well, I can't teach these students because I don't relate to them. It's happening in our classroom. The disconnect is happening in our classroom. The lack of belonging is happening in our classrooms. And so I want, this is a call for all of us. And I, when I said us, it's including myself, to be intentional about what will we do to disrupt anti-Black racism. We have seen our neighbors talking about books. What are the books in your classrooms? What are the stories you are reading? Who are the characters in your stories? How are black people featured in your stories? When last have you read a book where the star, the main character was black and it wasn't in deficit? When have you read a poem that was written by someone other than a white voice? When have you written, done your music lesson, the songs? I could tell you tons of stories. Let me get into my story because I'm a story person for those of you who know me well. A class of students are doing classical music and they have never for the entire, almost the end of a school year, their music teacher did not share once any classical singer who was non-white. She was upset. And then there came a, came a substitute teacher. And for the first time, the students saw pictures of, 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 of opera singers, the great Jesse Norman, Kathleen Battle, and Ray, Leontine Price, and realized that not all opera singers were white because the teacher did not chose to fill in the curriculum in a way that positioned other voices, black, indigenous, racialized voices in a certain way. So ask yourself, and I could use the entire time just to talk about that. What tools are you using to do your work? 
And how as an educator, you are intentional about bringing about change. You know, when we look at what's going on in education, especially in Canada, especially a couple of years ago, we see a lot of this kind of performance. Like, um, I don't know what's going on. You know, I, I, I don't have any black students. And I've heard a lot of teachers say that, that there are no black students in my class. The learning and the unlearning is not, is not for black students. It's not only for teachers with black students, it's for all of us. It's for how we have positioned others in our work and our pedagogy. There are still teachers in 2023, I can show you evidence of that, where they are still positioning anything other than white in very deficit ways in their, in their classrooms. There are teachers among us who lack the cultural competence necessary to engage with the changing face of the Ontario classroom. There are teachers who have, have no idea of what it is to advocate and stand up for social justice. And there are teachers whose classroom are unsafe. How do we do the work that we do? And I want us to realize that this is not a session where we are here to blame a teacher. We are here to hold ourselves accountable. And one of the first thing I find is when we get into these brave conversation, immediately somebody raised their hand and they said, well, I am not racist. I didn't say you were racist. That's not our event this evening. I am not here to call you racist, but I'm here to ask you, how are you being anti-racist? So I want us to realize that one of the biggest tools, and we'll get to that later on again, is ourselves as educators. And so what I did here is to show you a little bit of what's going on. So you realize that this thing is connected to all of us. There are incidents happening all around us. And these in issues, they are just few headlines that are connected to all of us. In the middle of George Floyd, I'm sure you remember the middle of George Floyd 2020, we saw in one of our school boards a big debacle with, 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 with the school magazine where a black student tribute to his grandmother was turned into a racist act. And the school board was investigating. We haven't heard the result yet. I hope it went, it went into a level of accountability and not for a mere apology. We saw in 2022, 2021, I think it was, when we thought we had had so many discussions about anti-Black racism and how we should show up in our classroom when a teacher from another school board show up at, 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 um, at um, Halloween with Blackface. And you ask yourself, where was this teacher when all was happening? And I'm going to tell you where that teacher was. He was a part of the workshops and he was a part of the learning and the unlearning. He's a part of the performance of equity because that is what we are, we are at, what is happening to us now, that we are so intelligent, we are so good, we are so OCT, we are so MED, we are so PhD, we are so educated that we know the right words to say, to perform equity, to perform anti-Black, to perform anti-racist, to perform that we are inclusive. But deep down inside, as educators, many of us are still not there. There's a, com there's, a, there's a comedy show that many of you know about, and it says, are we there yet? And so, no, we are not there yet. But what I why do I love to do this conversation? Because I want to say to educators, we are on a journey. So nobody should leave this evening saying, Dr. Campbell says, we are all supposed to be perfect. We are all supposed to have been a level of action that is disruptive. We are co-conspirators, we, we are accomplices. We have some form of award in anti-racist work because we are supposed to be there. That's not the truth. The truth is we are supposed to all be on a journey. And there are different parts of that journey. There are teachers among us right now, I guarantee, who have done amazing work within your school and your classroom and your boards. And there's teachers there who your heart is so engaged, but your action is not there as yet. And there are teachers among us who are totally oblivious or unaware of what's happening because they, they have chosen to stay in their cul-de-sac. 
and think this is the world. And so it's a journey, but what I wanna encourage all of us is to, is to make sure that you understand that we want to work so that the headlines among us will be different. That these disgusting headlines will not come near to our door step. And so what do we do? We engage in a journey of becoming anti-racist. And I want you to realize where I'm gonna say this. I want you, everybody to take a picture of this slide. And you are, by the way, you have permission to take a picture of me or any of my slides. That is, I am the, I am the public person here. And so that is absolutely okay. So you don't need my permission to take a picture of me or a picture of my slide or a little clip and post it on your social media. You don't need my permission for that. Absolutely. I want us to take a minute to look at the learning zone. And I want to encourage all of us to make sure we are at least there. Do not be stuck in the fear zone. I remember 2020, I was at, a, I was at an event at the Ontario Principal Council. I was one of the speakers. And I will never forget a principal, amazing, beautiful principal. She raised her hand and she said to me, Dr. ABC, I have, I don't sell, I have not celebrated Black History Month in my school. And I said, why? She said, because I'm scared to make a mistake. Anybody got that? You are scared to make a mistake in a celebration. And I, we had the most beautiful conversation. And I said to her, how does a celebration become a mistake? And she realized how much it had been ingrained in her that every time you go to, to anything about blackness, it goes to deficit. It goes to a slave ship. It goes to a story of war. It goes to that. And so immediately that's where our mind would go. And I said, think about all the levels of blackness you can celebrate today. Black art, black poetry, black music, black student, black excellence, black mental health and well-being, black, black, black audacity, black beauty, black fashion, black books, black authors. Look what you can celebrate. There's so much to celebrate. And of course, the story, our history is there as well. But that's how you're gonna start the celebration. I say, I want you to be conscious of that. Happy to say that principal has gone on to make sure that Black History Month is celebrated in our space. I call that learning. I call that growth. Ask yourself, how are you engaged in your own learning? We like an handout. We like a, a piece of paper. We like a copy of a PowerPoint so we can put it in the top of our, our desk drawer and not look at it again. I have been guilty. I've been a teacher, 20, 26 Septembers. My bio said 25, I'm now 26. 26 Septembers. I've been in a classroom, 26 Septembers. I know how many handouts have been lost in my drawer after five, six years, I remember it. So I want you to go deeper than a handout. I want you to invest in your own learning. Is it through music? Is it through songs? Is it through YouTube videos? Is it through attending workshops like these where you walk away deep in reflection? Because a lot of us, we are stuck in the fear zone. And some of us, we are stuck in the oppressive zone and the marginalization zone and the cultural blindness and the cultural destructiveness zone. Those are zones as well. But I'm not going to focus on that. Because I trust and hope none of us is there. And I believe that every one of you who are here this afternoon, you are intentional about being here. So I say welcome. I extend a special welcome to you because I know what it is to log into a workshop way after school is done. And I can tell you, every one of you could find five different things to do other than be here. You are here because you are intentional about your work. And it's not one of those forced occasions where you must show up because it's a staff meeting. And so I thank you. We're not going to do this discussion, but I leave it there because I want to show you what I do when I have a, a conversation that is maybe a two hour workshop. And one of the things I ask us, our, 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 our uh, teachers to do is to ask yourself, how does racism and anti-Black racism impact my community? 
And they said, they do ask me, what is the community you're talking about, Dr. ABC? And I said, it can be your work community, your home community, your church community, where you go to play football, where you go for sports, your gym is a community. Have you seen anti-Black racism in those spaces? And 99% I always get, absolutely. And people are intentional about listing and sharing. But let me be very, very honest here, Nancy and everybody else. I have been into spaces where when I asked this question, it took way more than 10 minutes for people to have two and three post-it. I have been there. Oh, I've been there. Let me just say this. I have seen it all. Or maybe I've seen a lot. I have been in workshops where people totally have nothing to share because somebody said, well, I don't think racism happened in my school or in Canada. And then I, I guess I disappoint them because I go into maybe 15 or 16 slides of what has happened in our schools. And I just ask them, where were you when this was happening on the news? I challenge them. My job is to challenge you. So if at any point in this conversation, you feel challenged, that is my job. My job is to have a courageous conversation with you. My, ears for us, my job here is for us to have a brave conversation. So I want you to understand it's important for you to see and name these things when you see them. When you see deficit thinking up in your school, you name it. When you see homophobia, you name it. When you hear transphobic conversation in the staff room, you name it. When you hear marginalization and oppressive practices, this um, um, and, um, ageism conversation, that's, you know, deficit things about persons who are, who are newer diverse or have certain other physical abilities or disabilities. It's your job as a teacher, as an educator, as a person to call those out. But that's the problem. We have a lot of persons who are unwilling to say this is what happening. And so when I ask groups, I want to share with you. I want to give you a view because you're not going to get the opportunity this afternoon to do that activity with me unless we do a workshop at another time. But I want you to see what teachers are listing. Take a picture of it. Look what teachers are listing. These are all from educators. Anybody remember I talk about the fear, the big fear factor is there? The brokenness in our community. These are listed by educators like yourselves and myself. I see the word fear somewhere else again at the top. I think the second one from the left at the top. We talk about belonging. We talk about um, 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 division. The word newcomers is there a lot. We talk about our immigrant, newcomer family. How are, how are you greeting and welcoming our newcomer family in your schools? How do they feel? Do they feel, do they hear racial slurs? Is it the first day of school or the second day that a child goes home and says, I feel bullied? Do they feel hate? Are they fearful of school when school is supposed to be the place of such joy? Here is another one. I'm from another set of teachers. Mm. These are voice of teachers. They are, they're microaggressions. The assumptions, the engagement of our teachers themselves, stereotyping children as problematic, blaming, sorry, blaming our children instead of the system, complimenting only people on their appearance and nothing else. And I share with you yet a last and final one. I want to give you an entire set of voices for you to see what people are saying. Now, I want you to ask yourself, and I want you to do, do me a favor. I want every one of you to jump in the chat box, and I want you to list, whether you saw it before or not, I want you to type in the chat for me, how do you believe, how do you see 
anti-black racism impact in your community? Take a minute to do that in the chat. It's important, practice naming things. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Practice naming things. There's too much pretense. Practice naming things. Practice calling it out. Practice saying that was inappropriate. That was racist. That was demeaning. That stripped that student of their dignity. That shattered that student's dream. We have to practice that. You only had six participants so far. I name it because that's what I do. For you to understand, it is our duty to do this work. Thank you. I see them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you don't need to overthink the answer. Simple things. I see the word depression, Gillette. I see the word overlooked. Powerful. I see you, Dominique. The assumption, the assumption, the assumption. And the truth is, we act. Oh, let me get ready for this. We act on those assumptions. Just remember, we act on those assumptions. Tokenism being ignored. And so I want to read for you a, li a line. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. You warmed my heart just now with your participation. I wanna read for you that a part of the introduction of the Stephen Lewis Report, 